And I'm thankful uh, to all the participants uh, for this wonderful event. I'm also happy to see some of my students who uh, opted to join us at this late hour and on the day of vacation. Uh, Professor Margreder, it has been a pleasure to have you here, and thank you so much again for visiting us. Um, we are after the 2022 elections in Israel, and we are uh, witnessing the formation of a hardcore right-wing coalition. And as I started earlier in the day, uh, this coalition seems uh, to want to restructure the balance of power between the politicians and the court. And they have in mind an override clause uh, that will enable the politicians a final say in constitutional matters. They are thinking of tinkering with the judicial appointment process so that the politicians will enjoy a majority and actually control both the appointment but also the removal of justices and judges, and that actually would threaten, even maybe eradicate, judicial independence. Uh, but that's not enough. On the agenda is also an idea to change via stat statutes uh, some of the common law doctrines that the court has developed over the years. And we are talking about doctrines such as justiciability, who can approach the court, uh, doctrines of uh, judicial intervention, such as reasonableness, uh, the kind of issues that the court can discuss, issues of justiciability. And when you ask the politicians, why? What's happening here? They are saying it's past time to redefine the relationship between the court and the politicians. The Israeli court has accumulated unprecedented power in comparative terms, and we are just uh, turning the clock back. And on the other hand, you hear uh, other voices uh, suggesting that there's nothing unique about the Israeli Supreme Court. Uh, you know, we are not in the Middle Ages. A judicial review can be found all over the world. And actually, in a weak separation of powers structure, such as Israel's, we need a strong court to protect minority rights, to protect individual rights. Now, what I, am, what I took upon myself uh, to examine in a forthcoming article titled on the, nexus, on the Nexus Between the Strength of Separation of Powers and the Power of the Judiciary, an article that is forthcoming with the William and Mary Bill of Rights Journal, I'm actually making four, I hope, innovative claims. The first is that there is an inverse relationship between the strength of separation of power structures and the power of judicial review. In other words, we should expect stronger uh, uh, judicial power <coughs> in uh, systems with weaker separation of power structure. And that is true both empirically, but also is justified strategically as well as theoretically. The second argument is that actually a web of common law judicial doctrines developed to um, manifest this connection between the strength of separation of powers and the strength of the judiciary. In other words, we see a web of common law judicial doctrines such as justiciability, techniques of interpretation, standing, deference, etc. enumerate many doctrines. And, they, and the content of those doctrines, the content is dictated by the strength of separation of powers in a given system. Okay, so this is the mechanism through which we make the correlation between the structure of separation of powers and the power of judicial uh, uh, review. The third point is that uh, actually, um, we have been studying those doctrines many times independently of one another, but they are all connected and connected to separation of powers. And the last point is that courts do connect individually between these doctrines and separation of powers. 
but they don't make the full. They don't see the for, They don't see the forest. They don't make the full story. And also scholars in comparative constitutional law many times suggest, you know, let's study from one system to another, but they uh, take apart the different features when they are all connected to the structure of separation of powers. Okay, so this is the endeavor. And in order to do so, I actually support my thesis by juxtaposing two Supreme Court decisions from two common law countries that deal with a similar dilemma whether immigration bans that are based on nationality are constitutional, even though they prevent citizens from uniting with their foreign uh, family members. So the first decision that I'm looking at is the Adala decision from 2006 that actually dealt with the legislative ban that, prevent, uh, uh, that prevents Palestinians from the West Bank and Gaza from entering into Israel in order to stay, reside, or naturalize, even when they have uh, spouses that are Israeli citizens. Now, we know that this legislative ban um, lapses on a yearly basis, but the government has the authority to renew with legislative approval, and the government has been doing so for the past 20 years. And currently, there is a petition, there are a few petitions, against the statute in front of the Israeli Supreme Court. So this is very much a live topic. And Israel has been denounced by many international organizations for, being, uh, uh, for holding a, an apartheid regime because of this legislative ban. So this is the first decision that I'm looking at, Adala. The second decision that I'm looking at is actually the Supreme Court decision of um, uh, the Trump travel ban. Uh, Trump actually prevented um, uh, foreigners from eight primarily Muslim countries from entering the US. Uh, this uh, travel ban was also, uh, the government was supposed to look at it at 180 days interval. Uh, it, the policy continued as long as Trump was in office. Eventually, when President Biden entered office on his first day, he abolishes uh, the ban. He argues this is xenophobic. This is a, a, a manifestation of animosity based on religion. OK, so we have two common law systems, um, um, bans based on nationality. Um, and uh, both countries do not have an explicit constitutional right to family unification. Nonetheless, when the two Supreme Court decisions decide to actually look at the matter, they argue that we should do so because of the interest of our citizens to unite with their family members. Now, um, it, it, both countries do study each other's arrangements with regard to immigration, with regard to security matters, and what is interesting is that both countries, uh, the courts of both countries decided to deny remedies, to uh, reject the uh, petitions, the, uh, uh, but in the shadow of the proceedings in both countries, the political branches did mitigate their policies. So I have a very nice uh, uh, case study in which a similar dilemma, similar result, but the reasoning is totally different in the two cases. And I break it apart and I show how separation of powers considerations play out and actually justify similar results, but through totally different opposing doctrines, okay? So actually when you look at the US with its strong separation of powers structure, right? So the US, just to remind everyone, right? So we have a presidential system Right, an, independ an independently elected president that is not dependent on parliament rule. We have a bicameral system, a two-house legislative structure, elected independently, etc. Uh, we have a, a federal uh, system, right? We have a allocation of power between the central government and state governments, and we have a supreme entrenched constitution. When we have all this structure, the strong separation of power structure, we can see the development of the following judicial doctrines that will support such structure. So first of all, deference, right? Deference to the executive branch in administrative matters. Now, that when you think about it through the lens of a presidential system, it makes sense, right? Because the court cannot easily assume that if it intervenes in administrative matters, 
the legislature can easily overrule the court. Right? We know that in a presidential system, um, the legislature may be controlled by one political party, the executive by another, so you see the development of a deference doctrine. Uh, justiciability and standing. Not everyone can bring the issue before the court. You need the actual harm um, in terms of justiciability. If it, the matter is uh, uh, within the province of other political branches, I, the court do not intervene. So we see, again, a support of separation of powers. Or, for example, when we look at the uh, willingness to, use impli to, to recognize implied constitutional rights, in our case, the right to family unification, the court is less willing to do so. We saw it also in Dobbs. Again, the idea we don't make rights, it is up to the representative branches. And I go and enumerate many, and it's so necessary, and the article is available, but um, uh, we, uh, the court enumerates, uh, uh, in the article I enumerate many common law doctrines that support a separation of powers. I will only give one last example, and this is a textualist or an originalist interpretation approach in which the courts argue, I'm trying to expose the meaning, I'm not trying to a, a, a write for, a, a, a write in style, instead of the founders, a, that constitutional text. Okay, now in the opposite common law doctrines develop in systems with weak separation of power structure. We will not see deference to the executive branch. A, a, a interpretation would be more purposive and so forth. So if you have a parliamentary system such as Israel, uh, with no federalism, bicameralism, or an interest Supreme Constitution, then actually you do see the opposite content of the common law doctrines. And in this type of system, with limited checks and balances, first of all, courts feel that they are justified in developing a different set of common law tools and giving different contents right, to the very doctrines, but also that the courts know that the cost of judicial error are low, because relatively low, because the legislature may undo quite easily a judicial decision. And also the political branches typically are willing to accept a, such um, um, doctrines by the courts because the political branches are aware that they can retaliate and, that they, and they are aware that the courts know that they may retaliate. So that actually keeps the courts restrained. So for example, in the Israeli case, it's easy for the court to recognize an implied constitutional right to family unification as the court has actually done in 2012. But nonetheless, in the two cases so far, the court decided not to intervene. And it's not surprising when taking into account the fact that we have a weak separation of power structure and the ability of the judicial, uh, of the political branches to retaliate. So what I'm actually suggesting is that if we look at the current proposals of the current forming coalition, if you want to try and, and, and reduce the judicial power of the court, you cannot do so without augmenting the power of separation, the, the, the structure of separation of powers. And if you do not do so, then you actually compromise to a great extent the nature of the democratic system in Israel, like you cannot, on the one hand, cut the court, but on the other hand, not strengthen a separation of powers. And this is actually what is supported by my research. So I conclude that this exercise in comparative constitutional suggests that paradoxically, countries on opposite sides of the spectrum with regard to separation of powers may reach similar results of restraint, but using totally different reasoning and totally different common law, the content of common law doctrines. And we should study those doctrines together rather than separately. And all these stories suggest that the <laughs> representative, uh, um, that the courts uh, can uh, supplement the representative branches, but they cannot replace the democratic nature of society. Thank you so much.